let's look at five more features being introduced in Go 1.24. If you missed the last video covering another five features of Go 1.24, you can find the link to it in the description. Directory limited file system access will be a feature in Go 1.24. Consider this code that reads from the file system. The important thing to notice here is the guard clause at the top of the open file function, checking if the file is within the application's data directory. Only if the file is underneath the application's root directory will it be read, otherwise an error is returned. In our case, this prevented an SSH private key being read, a scenario that might occur if the user is able to specify arbitrary files to read. If we run this code and attempt to open the SSH key, we will get the desired error. In Go 1.24, this can be simplified using the new os.root type. Let's rewrite our code to make use of it. We'll remove our open file method, since it only exists to encapsulate our guard clause. We'll move the os.open function to where our open file function used to be, and create a root object by opening the application's root directory using the new os.openRoot function. Finally, we'll use this root object to open our file instead of os. Running this code to read the SSH key gives us the same error message from before, but without having to implement it ourselves. Improved finalizers will be added in Go 1.24. In Go, a finalizer is a function that is run when an object becomes unreachable from the code and the garbage collector is about to reclaim its memory. The point of them is to perform any additional steps required in the cleanup of the object that wouldn't be carried out by simply reclaiming the memory. Let's write some code that shows how this works. We'll start with our main package boilerplate, before defining a custom type called file wrapper that wraps an OS file. We'll create a temporary file and wrap it in our custom file wrapper. Now we'll set a finalizer function on our wrapped file, in which we'll print some useful output before closing the wrapped file. Now we need the file wrapper to go out of scope, which we can simulate by setting its pointer to nil. Finally, we run the garbage collector and sleep for a second to allow the finalizer time to run. As expected, we see the output from our function, indicating the wrapped file has been closed successfully. While this simple example may look fine, finalizers have a number of issues, including a finalizer can only be called once. The way they work is the garbage collector runs them before removing them from the object. So if an object gets resurrected during finalization, the finalizer will not be able to clean it up a second time, causing a memory leak. Since objects with finalizers require two runs of the garbage collector to be released, it can be some time before the resources associated with that object are cleaned up. And you only attach a single finalizer to an object. So if you have multiple files and connections to close, you need to pile all that logic into a single function, which will be quite a mess and difficult to maintain. Go 1.24 adds the add cleanup function to the runtime library, with the recommendation that all new code use it in place of set finalizer. Add cleanup behaves the same way as set finalizer by being attached to an object and running after the garbage collector runs, but with some notable improvements over set finalizer. Multiple cleanup functions can be attached to a single object, allowing you to split the cleanup of different resources into different functions. And the chances of an object being resurrected are reduced since add cleanup takes both the pointer and the underlying resource as arguments and panics if they are the same. Despite this, add cleanup still shares some limitations with set finalizer, including since cleanups are only run by the garbage collector, this couples them to memory utilization and doesn't take into account the utilization of other scarce resources such as file descriptors. And the cleanup function isn't guaranteed to run as soon as the object becomes unreachable, rather at some point after. It is therefore not a good idea to rely on it for timely deallocation of memory. So despite finalizers being improved in Go 1.24, they should still only be used sparingly as a safety net, and deferred functions should continue to be relied on for releasing resources. Go 1.24 introduces two new interfaces to the encoding package that are implemented by many more packages in the standard library, text appender and binary appender. Since so many packages implement these interfaces, we'll just use one package to examine them. 
We'll use the time package, since it's one of the few that implements both interfaces. We'll just look at the text appender, since learning about that will automatically teach us about the binary appender. These two interfaces each define a single function, append text for the text appender, and append binary for the binary appender. The purpose of these interfaces is to append text or binary representations of a type to a byte slice. Let's look at how that works with time.appendText function. We'll start with some main package boilerplate and define a string to which we want our time appended. We'll append the time to this string in two different ways before printing it. First, we'll define the current time and print it using the FMT package. Quite straightforward. Now, we'll use the new append text function to create a single string that we can print. Running this code, we'll print the same time twice, albeit with slight differences in formatting that can be ironed out if you ever do this in production. Go 1.24 introduces a new environment variable called GoAuth to make it easier to get the modules from private repositories. It is a semicolon separated list of authentication commands that can be tried one at a time until one works. Go supports multiple methods for authenticating with private module repositories. Prior to Go 1.24, you couldn't tell Go which one to use. It would just use the first one that worked. The GoAuth variable allows you to specify your desired authentication method, giving developers more control over the development process. Let's look at the possible values of this variable before looking at some examples of how to use it. There are four possible values for GoAuth. Off, which disables authentication entirely, NetRC, which uses credentials specified in a .netrc file in your home directory, Git, with a specified directory, which uses credentials stored in the Git credential helper, and Command, which specifies an arbitrary command to execute, which returns headers that are attached to HTTP requests. You can chain all of these together in any order you want, separated by semicolons. Let's see how we use each of these values. The off option is a straightforward option that disables authentication. If we try to get a private module with this option set, we get an authentication error. The netrc option tells goget to use credentials specified in a .netrc file found in the home directory. If you're not familiar with this file, it's a general purpose file used by many applications to authenticate with services. For every host name, there is a username and password to authenticate with that host. If we now try to get a module with valid credentials set for the github.com machine, we get a new error. This is because our private module does not have a checksum that can be used to validate its authenticity, so we need to tell goget to ignore that by adding our github URL to the go private variable. The git option specifies an absolute path to a git directory, containing a .git credentials file in its root. This repository has a credential helper set to this file, allowing the credentials to be used by git. Let's see how that works. We'll create a new directory for our demo and move into it. We'll then disable authenticity checking of Go modules as well as the git terminal prompt. This last one will prevent git asking us for a username and password in the terminal. Next, we'll create a git repo set its credential helper to be a local file called .git credentials before adding our credentials to the credentials file. Finally, we'll initialize our module and get our private module. The final option for goauth is a command to invoke a custom authenticator. The output of this command is a set of HTTP headers to be attached to requests to the private repository. You can specify any command you want, provided its output is in the following format which returns this example. Here we have an authorization header with a bearer token generated by the command, which allows authentication with a private repository without leaving hard-coded credentials lying at rest in a netrc file. Various types in the go types package are getting new functions that return an iterator over their internal data. Let's look at an example using the union type. We'll start with our main package boilerplate, before defining an array of terms which we'll use to create a union. Now in Go 1.23, if we wanted to iterate over these terms, we would use a C-style for loop with the length of the union as the upper bound. 
We then use the term function to access the term at the given index. In Go 1.24, we just range over the new terms function. Here is the full list of new functions being introduced to this package. That's five more features of the upcoming Go 1.24. If you made it this far and found this video useful, please consider leaving a like. It really, really helps the channel. If you didn't see my first video on five features in Go, why not check it out? You'll find a link in the description.